Βρισκόμαστε στις πανεπιστημιακές εκδόσεις Κρήτης και έχουμε μαζί μας τον καθηγητή Αλεξάνδερ Τζόνς για να συζητήσουμε για το καινούριο του βιβλίο «Ένας φορητός κόσμος φέρνοντας στο φως τον μηχανισμό των αντικειθήρων ένα επιστημονικό θαύμα του αρχαίου κόσμου». Τι σας ώθησε να ασχοληθείτε με το μηχανισμό των αντικειθήρων και αν μπορείτε να μοιραστείτε μαζί μας δύο εμπειρίες σας, μία ευχάριστη και μία δυσάρεστη. Well, I came to the study of the mechanism through my broader interest in ancient science, especially Greek science, and my particular love is ancient astronomy. Uh, when I first learned of the new work that was beginning in 2005-2006 to do uh, investigations of the fragments of the mechanism using the X-ray tomography and the surface imaging, the reflectance transformation imaging, and that this was bringing results that made the mechanism much more interesting as an astronomical device than anyone had known before. Uh, this drew me in, and I started seeing more and more connections between the mechanism and things that I knew something about from other sources, whether we are talking about texts that survived from the ancient Greek world, or sometimes from neighboring cultures like Egypt, Mesopotamia, but sometimes also simpler objects like ancient sundials, inscriptions, and so on, I realized that this was becoming a kind of a focal point for understanding what astronomy meant for an ancient Greek, and not necessarily a Greek scientist, but an ordinary Greek living in a city somewhere in the Aegean world. Uh, how was the mechanism a kind of embodiment of a large part of what the sky meant to human beings? So I got involved in the project a bit after the initial work was done in, in early 2007. And my particular part in the project was working on the many texts that are inscribed in tiny Greek letters on what were the outside faces, the dials of the mechanism. These are very hard to read. No one had been able to read most of them with any accuracy. I mean, we could, we could see some words, some parts of words, but you could not read an entire sentence, and it, no one really knew what these texts were trying to say. Um, so I was one of the group of people who, over a 10-year period, uh, were trying to make these into readable ancient Greek texts about astronomy and technology. It was very rewarding work, very hard work. And uh, I, one of the things I really enjoyed was doing this in collaboration with a team of people coming from many different backgrounds, scientific, historical, um, and uh, you know, we, we sometimes worked separately and sometimes we would compare what we were seeing and what we were making out of it. So that, I think, was for me one of the high points, maybe the main high point of the experience. And of course, learning new things about ancient astronomy. I can't really say talk about low points in this. I, I mean, I, I feel looking back on this very warm about the whole opportunity to have been able to get involved with one of the most exciting remains we have from 2000 years ago. Εκτός της μοναδικότητάς του, ποιοι άλλοι παραγοντές κάνουν τον μηχανισμό των αντικειθήρων ένα τόσο σημαντικό αντικείμενο μελέτης; Let me start with the particular question first about using the word computer for it. This is difficult, I think. Um, it, the word computer was first used to describe the mechanism by Derek de Sola Price, who began to study the mechanism already in the early 1950s before he had seen it. He, he had only read about it and seen some very poor photographs that had been published. And then in 1958, he came to Athens, he examined the fragments for just a few days, about 10 days he was in Athens then. And then he wrote a, a famous article in Scientific American about it and was continuing to work for some years afterwards on it. And he began calling it a calendar computer. Now, in the 1950s, this was just the beginning of people knowing about modern computers, programmable digital electronic computers. And usually when one spoke of a computer before that, one meant something more physical, what was called an analog computer, that would give you a calculated result through movements and shapes, like a slide rule, for example, that engineers used to calculate with. And the antikythera mechanism is that kind of computer. We have almost forgotten that meaning of computer. 
I prefer not to use the word because of that. Uh, I prefer to say a calculator or a simulator because now we know that the idea is to show all these different cosmic and human cycles connected with time all at the same time in a very visual way. Διαβάζοντας το βιβλίο σας διαπίστωσα ότι υπάρχουν ακόμα αρκετά ερωτήματα που περιμένουν απάντηση. Ποια θα λέγατε ότι είναι τα σημαντικότερα εξ αυτών. I think we have a general idea of the accuracy of the mechanism, but there are different factors in this. One of them is how good was the Greek knowledge of astronomy at the time it was made that is embodied in the mechanism. And of course, that was not what it became later in at the, the peak of Greek astronomy, which comes about 300 years later with the work of Claudius Ptolemy, Claudius Ptolemaios in Egypt, um, which has uh, theories that can predict where planets appear in the sky, where the sun appears, where the moon appears, how eclipses will appear, to a precision that is sometimes quite a bit better than one degree of arc. That was as good as Greek astronomy got, and it is very good indeed. It's as really a, almost as good as you can get with the assumption that the Earth is the center of the system. With the Antikythera mechanism, we're in an earlier stage, and Greek astronomers had an understanding, say, that planets move in circular paths that themselves, they imagine, are moving in circles around the Earth. So you get the combination of what we would call the Earth's orbit and the planet's or orbit to get what we see from the Earth. But they don't have a full knowledge of the offsets, the things that make the orbits not true circles, but ellipses. So, and Ptolemy has some way to understanding that, but in the mechanism, almost certainly not. So that is one inaccuracy, and it could not have been better at the time because there was simply was not the knowledge. The other is the inaccuracies that come from the, me the mechanical elements themselves, like how accurately were the gears manufactured so that the teeth would not slip against each other, so there would not be uneven spacing. That, that's something that we can try to measure from what survives. And it seems that some parts would have been, if you, if you really wanted to know where the moon was to the degree, it would not have given such a good result because there are so many gears and the way they connect make the, the errors magnify from the, the source to the output. So the, the ideas behind it are much more impressive than the, the fine level of precision of the results. I think for what it was probably made to do, this did not matter. But there were simply limitations, both technical and scientific. I was yesterday in the presentation that you did on the Astroscopy of Athens, and I believe that the participants in the presentation χρειάστηκε να απαντήσουν σε αρκετές ερωτήσεις που είχαν να κάνουν με το κατά πόσο ο μηχανισμός έχει και κρυφές πλευρές, αν μπορούμε να το πούμε έτσι. Ποια είναι η γνώμη σας ε, γι' αυτό. Miracles probably not. There may be particular cases in which people knew how to do some particular kind of thing that we have forgotten, perhaps because we no longer really want to do it, or in some cases because There's something like a recipe that is not surviving. I don't think on the large scale this is really likely. I mean, we have to, we have to recognize we are dealing with a stage of understanding, I mean, particularly on the technological side, understanding of how you can make complex actions happen, which is obviously far removed from the modern world of electronic devices, uh, materials that can stand strong, you know, powers. You know, the, the, the invention of the steam engine in antiquity was to make a sort of a toy that span. The real steam engine that could do work needed materials that could stand the pressures of, of water heated to high temperatures and that would not all burst apart. And so there's a great difference between what a heron of Alexandria could do 2,000 years ago and what, uh, uh, what say, uh, uh, James Watt could do 300 years ago. Uh, still, I mean, when we think in terms of that level of ability for the time, with the mechanism, we, you really see that this is something that must have been very close to the practical boundaries of what was possible. It was a showpiece that showed the very best work that could be done. Από την χθεσινή σας παρουσίαση, έγινε σαφές ότι υπάρχει 
αρκετός κόσμος που νιώθει πως δεν είμαστε σίγουροι για πολλά πράγματα του μηχανισμού. Δεν είμαστε σίγουροι για το εργαστήρι που τον κατασκεύασε. Αν το εργαστήρι αυτό ε, είχε κατασκευάσει και άλλους μηχανισμούς ή και άλλα εξίσου τεχνολογικά εξελιγμένα αντικείμενα. Επίσης δεν γνωρίζουμε σε ποιον πήγαινε, γιατί το ήθελε αυτός ο άνθρωπος σε ένα τόσο εξελιγμένο εργαλείο. Και τέλος, α, μας είχε κάνει και λίγο εντύπωση ότι το εγχειρίδιο χρήσης του μηχανισμού ε, είχε πάρα πολύ μικρά γράμματα, δηλαδή θα ήταν πολύ δύσκολο κάποιος να το διαβάσει με ε, γυμνομάτι. Είναι διάφορες έτσι, ερωτήσεις που άκουσα στο κοινό και ήθελα να τις μοιραστώ μαζί σας γιατί εχθές δεν ήταν εφικτό να ακούσουν όλες αυτές. Those are very interesting questions and there are some of the questions that I think all of us who work on the mechanism keep asking ourselves. Who would have made it? Are we talking about one person? Are we talking about a team? Who was it made for? Who would have a use for it? What would be the use? So let me begin with the, the problem of you know, designing it, manufacturing it. I can't imagine that this was one person's work ever, that you have to have a team. You have to have a workshop. First of all, a very good, sophisticated metalworking workshop that is making high precision devices. Uh, the kinds of things that we know, for example, some, for, from some of the ancient medical instruments where you have screw fittings that would have to, to, for this to work at all, they would have to be very carefully made so that you could turn something over and over again and it would not jam. So the mechanism is full of that kind of thing. There are no screws in it, but there are things that are equivalent in the sense that for things to move at all, you have to have exactly the right shape and no possibility that one part can run into another and block things. So here we have the, the technical know-how worth working with materials. Um, at the same time, the, the design has a mathematical and a, an astronomical element. Someone had to provide the agenda for it. What are we going to try to show on this thing? And then that would involve some interaction with the technical people who are saying, this is what we can actually make. These are the limits of the materials. These are the potentials. We could experiment with this. But no, we can't do that. So, for example, someone coming from the astronomical end would say, I would love to be able to show how eclipses happen. And I would like to show that when the moon is eclipsed, it goes into the shadow of the earth that the sun is casting. And the designer may think a bit about this and say, well, that's going to be very difficult because what you need to do then is have the moon sometimes go above the earth's shadow so you have no eclipse, sometimes through the shadow so you have a total eclipse, sometimes grazing the shadow so you have a partial eclipse. And we can't do that, might have been the answer. So then the astronomer goes back and says, well, can you at least make something that would be able to show when eclipses happen and would show how long they last and what time it would happen? And then with some conversation, the mechanical end would say, yes, we can do that. It would involve maybe making a spiral dial of this kind. So we can put a lot of information on the scale And, uh, and so this is, I think, how it must have evolved, through a back and forth. And the, the in-between is finding ways that you can make a number of gears give the output you want. And that's a mathematical problem. You, you need to be able to take certain astronomical data, ratios, uh, and translate them into gears that have a reasonable number of teeth on them. And not too many gears, because the more gears you have, the more chances of breakdown and error that you would get. So I, I imagine we're dealing probably with, you know, several people doing the metal working, probably a specialist for doing the inscribed text, which I'll come back to, <laughs> and, and then the, the scientific sort of consulting end that is designing it. Um, you know, at the same time, maybe this is something that could develop through intensive collaboration over years and decades. I don't think it needs centuries to do. I think that you know, as long as there's an interest in doing better and better, You could maybe in 20, 30 years of things go from almost nothing to the very, from the simplest mechanisms that might just show the sun and the moon doing their monthly and yearly motions to something as elaborate as the Antikythera mechanism is. Okay, who would want one and why? Uh, I, can, I can imagine maybe three different types of people who could want something at least like the Antikythera mechanism, maybe not exactly the one we have. One would be, yes, the, uh, 
the, the, the rich man who just wants to have something to show how rich he is and how intellectual he is. So here I have this wonderful astronomical, mechanical toy on my shelf. And look, I can show you the moving parts. I don't understand what it's showing you, but isn't it wonderful? Doesn't it show how, how important and rich I am to have it? That's one possibility. But I think you wouldn't have that unless you had people who really had some understanding of it too. For me, the model person for the Antikythera mechanism itself is the, the Stoic philosopher Posidonius, who was known, he was very well known around the same time that the mechanism sank in the shipwreck. He was a, a teacher of philosophy living on the island of Rhodes. He came from Syria, but moved to Rhodes and had a school. And some of the people who came to the school were Romans, like the, like the Roman statesman uh, and philosopher Cicero, who tells us that Posidonius had something that he calls in Latin a sphira, a sphere. But it seems to be uh, something very similar to at least part of what the Antikythera mechanism is. It, as Cicero says, it, it had with, with one input motion, it showed all the diverse movements of the sun and the moon and the planets. So here is someone for whom this would be a tremendous kind of classroom demonstration device, probably for very small classes or individuals, not a lecture full of 200 people. It's too small for that. But for, the, for an elite group, you could talk about, you know, today I could be talking as the philosopher, I could talk about the structures of calendars and how they relate to the lunar phases and so on. Next week I could be talking about the causes of eclipses, and then the following week I could be talking about stars and their connection with weather changes. It's just what the displays on the mechanism does. And then a third kind. I think not for our mechanism, but maybe for sisters and cousins of it that had different choices of what to show, would be the, the high-class astrologer. Uh, these are people, again, around the time of the shipwreck, we know that there are people who are, uh, who, who are making the horoscopes of elite people you know, taking their birth dates and turning them into where were the sun, moon, and planets in the zodiac on that date, and what does that mean for that person's character, personality, for his life? Um, and they worked mostly with tables. You know, the astronomers generated tables of numbers from which you could find where all the planets were on any date. But if you had a machine that could show this to the client, think of how how wonderful that would be as a a bit of theater. Uh, the, 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 the idea that you could make visual the cosmos and show what, what was the world doing when you were born. Uh, I, I think that would be very powerful, but it would be somewhat different from the one we have. So here are three possibilities. Εάν θεωρήσουμε ότι ήταν ένα τόσο εξαιρετικό εργαστήριο που κατασκεύασε αυτό τον μηχανισμό, το λογικό είναι ότι θα ήταν γνωστό σε όλο τον τότε κόσμο, γνωστό κόσμο, οπότε θα έπρεπε κάπου να αναφέρεται, δηλαδή να υπάρχουν κάποιες γραφές που να μιλάνε για αυτό το πολύ δυνατό εργαστήριο κατασκευής μηχανισμών ή παρόμοιων αυτοματισμών. Γιατί δεν έχουμε βρει κάποιες γραφές που να αναφέρουν αυτό το εργαστήριο. It's a very good question why we don't hear in the ancient literature about these individuals or workshops who could make something like the Antikythera mechanism. Why were they not more famous so that we would know the names, perhaps? Um, it, hard to say exactly why this is, but it is a fact that there was a lot of fancy mechanical technology that we'd know about, not just gear work like the mechanism, but all the pneumatic hydraulic machines that Heron of Alexandria de describes in his books. But he didn't probably make them himself. There were craftspeople who made these things, and they were presumably common enough that this was a much better known part of the, the fancy high-end technology of the time than astronomical gearwork devices were. And yet, we don't hear about them as individuals either. So I think what we're dealing with is a kind of disconnect between the literary part of ancient society that wrote the books that came through the Middle Ages to us, and the, this other very skilled, and I'm sure to a great extent literate in a different plane, uh, th that world of craftspeople, uh, they, they work together, but they don't come into the writers who 
we are able to read now. So it's a shame because they, they've, they've been silenced as individuals and we, only can, we can only admire them as the imagined creators of the wonderful things that we see in museums. Same would go for, for example, the designers of the beautiful ancient jewelry that we have. A different kind of very fine metalworking here in gold or silver, say. Uh, we don't know unless somebody signs something uh, who made an object. Maybe the Antikythera mechanism had somewhere a little line saying, I, uh, you know, whoever it was made this. Uh, but if so, that's a bit of plate we haven't found yet. Uh, but yes, and, and that, that connects with another question that you asked about the inscriptions themselves. They are in very tiny inscribed letters. The sizes vary. The, the, the tiniest lettering is on the dials themselves. Um, and then you have texts that are in somewhat larger lettering that are written line by line like a page of a book. Um, and of course, as they are now, they really are very hard to read. If you, if you look at the fragments in the museum where there is text on the outside, uh, and even if you're used to reading Greek inscriptions on stone, these, even knowing what it says there already, it's not easy to read. But part of that is that, of course, they are very corroded. In some cases, what you see on the object in the museum is mirror writing, because we're not seeing the original inscribed plate. What we're seeing is some of the other material that was lying against that plate, which then disappeared. And so we have a kind of negative impress of the writing in backwards writing. Um, but another thing I think is that, you know, when these, when these plates were new and the writing was sharp sort of gouging of the letters, they would have been more legible. We read very small writing too. You, 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 you look at, a, at, a, at a, 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 a smartphone screen and you're often reading this very tiny uh, writing, but, and of course, you know, as, as people get older eyes, as I have, you need to have it made bigger. Uh, but the, I think when it was new, and possibly also at a time when there may have been some paint in the letters, as there often was on stone inscriptions, to make them more legible than they are now that they're all weathered and just stone, um, it wouldn't have been impossible to read these things. So, I mean, look at ancient coins, the inscriptions on them were on letters every bit as small. Ίσως ο κατασκευαστής θα ήθελε να κρατήσει ένα χαμηλό προφίλ. Certainly low profile from from us our point of view 2000 years later. I really don't know what it would have been like. Suppose suppose this workshop was as we we think is at least credible in Crete. Uh, sorry, in Rhodes and maybe in the in the city of Rhodes. Uh, within that city perhaps this workshop was well known, but it, it probably made more kinds of things. The market for these astronomical things is probably very, very small. But maybe they made medical instruments as well. Maybe someone like Hipparchus, who lived on roads and did astronomical observations, had these people make the very elaborate observational instruments that an astronomer needed to get the data which ultimately went into the design. There, there are many ways in which this sort of uh, complex metalwork technology could have been applied. But using different kinds of parts and different kinds of connections. Μια τελευταία ερώτηση για σας. Αν είχατε τη δυνατότητα να ταξιδέψετε πίσω στο χρόνο και να συμμετέχετε στην κατασκευή του μηχανισμού, τι θα θέλατε να έχει προσθεθεί στο μηχανισμό ώστε να τον κάνει ακόμα πιο χρήσιμο και όμορφο και διπωσιακό; That 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 is a question that is asking me to go outside my role as a historian. Because as a historian, I want to know what was really there. I, I don't want to imagine what could have been there. So I'm happy to do that, but I do need to say, this is now becoming a different person. And you're, you're asking me to go in a time machine and go visit this shop, talk to the, the project leader. What would I ask for? Well, I think so far as I can tell, this device did practically everything that you could have expected for an astronomical device that is showing things on the order of time that is from days up to periods of many years. You know, some of the things that are shown take almost a century to happen. Like the, the long calendar cycle is 76 years long. Uh, Saturn takes 30 years to go all the way around the zodiac. So various things in the mechanism have to be simulated on this big time scale that's like a human life. And the shortest times that it's really showing are like single days. 
And those, are, those times are so short that it's not really showing them with complete precision because it can't. So I would be tempted to ask, well, all right, what can you do now to make, maybe not build it into this device, because that would be really making it far too stressed to show time scales going to very short time. But can you make a sort of parallel device that is going to show what happens on the order of parts of a day, like the, the rising and setting of the constellations through the night, that sort of a thing. And of course, we know that in ancient times later on, they did this. They, they made clocks that were driven by water that showed not just the time of day and night without needing the sun to cast a shadow on a sundial, but also what constellations were above the horizon, whether, whether you're in daylight or not. You, you could know that even though the sun is shining, uh, say, uh, Gemini is up there somewhere. And in fact, we can tell you where it is. Uh, so was this something this, this shop could do? And then again, I could, you know, taking advantage of the fact that I'm coming from the time machine, I could cheat and say, okay, well, I happen to know what the Greek astronomers are going to know a few hundred years from now. And so would you be able to make me gears, gears that can do these more complex things that the future astronomers are going to know about? Like that, uh, well, for example, that every time that Mars goes through one of its cycles of becoming visible and invisible, going forwards and backwards, each cycle is a bit different from every other one. Your device, this antikether mechanism, shows every one of them exactly the same. It's just pushed along. Uh, can you make them bigger and smaller, slower and faster in a way that will match what the astronomers are going to know? That would be interesting to, uh, as a kind of a challenge to say, how much more complicated can you make this thing before it's just going to break down? Alexander Sous, ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που μοιράστηκε όλη αυτή την πληροφορία μαζί μας, που βρέθηκε στην Ελλάδα, εκ μέρους των εκδόσεων Κρήτης, πανεπιστημιακών εκδόσεων Κρήτης, και πάλι ένα μεγάλο ευχαριστώ για τον χρόνο σας. Well, thank you very much for some very interesting and challenging questions. It's been very good to talk to you.